what does it take for someone, an individual who is faced with absolute destruction, who's faced with total annihilation as an individual to confront insanity? What does it take for two such individuals to come together to form one unit where they both individually are assaulted and as a couple or complementary pair will be assaulted even more to decide to come together to confront insanity? What does it take for these two individuals, knowing what's out there, knowing what awaits anything that they produce to procreate, to bring a child into this insanity? What does that take? I would argue that it takes a warrior spirit. I would argue that it would take these individuals clearly understanding that they are their ancestors and a strong desire to be African. I was brought up to believe that a man is someone who can stand. Whether you've got 40,000 people behind you or zero, and that 40,000 people is in front of you. I was raised to believe that a man is supposed to stand on his own two feet. No matter what anybody says or does, if he knows that he is correct, I believe the same thing applies to women. And I think our history bears that out. So tonight, this evening, I want to talk about a number of things having to do with that couple who has come together, or men and women who are thinking about forming a couple and what they will have to deal with. And part of this discussion will focus on differences between complementarity between Europeans and Africans. And I use this word complementarity very necessarily. We operate as Africans under a collection of principles that were given to us by the goddess Ma'at. Ma'at was the goddess of truth, justice, order, balance, righteousness, reciprocity, and a whole collection of other things in the pantheon of European, excuse me, of African gods and goddesses. Complementarity is the process whereby two individuals, because we're talking about couples here, two individuals, a male and a female, come together understanding that neither one is perfect, that each one is lacking. They find that individual who has what they don't have. If I'm on the front line and I have bullets, then I need somebody who's got a gun. So you look for that individual who has what you need, not to make you whole because you're whole just because you are you, but you look for somebody who can help you to fight this war better, who can help you to stand on the front lines taller. That's what complementarity is all about. The African universe is about order, balance. It's about bringing things together in a procreative fashion. In this society, we're so used to saying opposites attract. European mentality, competition, at war, um, intimacy as a power battle, as a relationships as a fight. This is expected. When you go into a relationship with someone and you expect to battle, Africans didn't say opposites attract. And maybe I'm putting words into their mouth because I have no record of this, but I'm sure if they didn't say it, they shouldn't have thought compliments attract. You're looking for somebody to work with. You're not looking for somebody to work against. You're not looking for somebody to engage in a power struggle over who's going to dominate the situation. You're looking for somebody to work with. That's a major psychological distinction in terms of how you even approach 
the situation. I didn't know this, but because of how I was raised, I didn't look for somebody who was my opposite. I knew my faults. I knew my flaws. I remember when I was in graduate school, my mother sent me this thing that says, um, I forgot what it said now, but it says something equivalent to um, being stupid is when you don't know what your faults are. And I knew what my faults were. And this woman studied me just like I studied her. And we found that most of what I didn't have, she had. And most of what she didn't have, I had. So we made a good compliment or complimentary pair. Sad that we don't do too much of that anymore. People get married before they find out that this person wants six children and they only want one. But if this person is a Baptist and this other person is Buddhist, or somebody wants to live in D.C. and somebody else wants to live in Atlanta. <laughs> For African people, the marital institution was sacred. This is something that was mind-boggling to me when I was coming up as I began to see more and more people getting divorced. How can you sit up and make a promise to the Creator? That's what you do when you get married. You swear an oath. You make a promise to the Creator. I will love and cherish this person until they die. I swear to you. And then move to a point where that can't work anymore. This, and I, I, I get off track when I get to this point. because <laughs> The things that we break up over, not even talking about the things that we didn't check out before we got together, which should have told us something, but the things that we break up over. In sociology, we had this concept called tremendous trifles. And tremendous trifles are little stupid things, and I do mean the word stupid. There's a difference between stupid and ignorant. Ignorance means you don't know. Stupid means you know what you do anyway. <laughs> tremendous trifles are stupid. We have been raised, and we're raising even more so now as we spoil them more, people who are so self-centered that they can't take difficulty. They can't take being challenged. They can't take disagreement. So. Me being one of the children that we have raised, I'll go into the bathroom for the fourth time this week, and the cap is off the toothpaste again. I'm through. I'm gone. You can have it. Let's get it now. <laughs> Tremendous trifle. Stupidity. But you'll see people breaking up over the dumbest of things, and some getting married over even dumber things. If he's not African, you don't want him. If he's not European, excuse me, if she's not African, you don't want her. And the only evidence of that is if the person is doing the work. Then and now. I want to know only one question. I want to know, well, it's really it's two questions, but it's two and one. What is your vision? And what are you doing now? Not what you're dreaming about now, not what you did yesterday. What are you doing right now? to move you in that direction. Because then I can see evidence. I try to follow in the footsteps of sisters who had to make these choices, older sisters who had to make these choices. Sisters have this uncanny ability to measure potential. Am I lying? No. Sisters have an uncanny ability to, marry, to, to, to measure potential. When my wife met me, I was a drunk, I was on drugs, I really didn't care about Jack. All I wanted to do was party. I had been doing it for 20 years before I met her almost. That was my life. But this woman could see potential. She saw that clearly, I guess like a, a diamond in the rough or some mess. She could see that. And she grabbed hold of it and she helped me to find my way out of that stupidity. But she was able to see that. I don't have that ability, so I'm assuming that it's a female characteristic because I've seen other women do it. 
So sisters, use that potential. Use that ability. If he's not working, then keep right on going. That's we find each other at work. Falling in love in terms of the African tradition. Well, let's say the Euro European tradition first. You fall in love. You see this person, you fall in love, right? Um, instant love. I fell in love in half a second. Yeah, just saw her face, just saw his face, and felt that little pitter-patter and lost my balance and all the rest of that stuff, and I'm, I'm in love. You probably felt high blood pressure, but you thought it was love. In our tradition, and understand these are old, wise truths. This isn't just something that some African made up uh, 100 years ago. These are old, wise truths. Our proverbs come from hundreds of generations of experience. They come from the wisdom of a people. They're not a quote by one particular person. They are the wisdom of a people. You can't patent that. Africans invented all kinds of stuff. There wasn't, any, wasn't a system of patenting, not only because people could trust each other, but because everything belonged to everybody. Didn't make you into a non-individual. Made you better because your whole goal was to improve with people, not just your sorry, selfish self. You know that you are in love when you have been with somebody long enough to know, to know that that person will die for you. To know, absolutely, without question, to know that that person will die for you. That's when you know you're in love. It's when you get to the top of the mountain, not when you're at the base. It's when you get there, over that hard, long terrain, that rough terrain, where you find out that that person can't tolerate you. I know that if somebody breaks into my house at 3 o'clock in the morning, gets a jump on me, knocks me down, beat me upside the head, I know that my wife is not going to sit there seeing who's got the best position right now. She will pull out that nine and she will blow his brains out. And then she'll drop the gun and freak out. I know that. And she knows the same thing for me. This is like old school. I don't understand what old school. No, this is new school. This is the way I was raised. I know for a fact that if somebody put his hands on me and killed me, my father wasn't going to say nothing. He wasn't calling any cops. He understood his responsibility, and he understood that when he took on those responsibilities, they may send him to jail. I have watched my mother go off on people because she understood her responsibilities. The ramifications from them was irrelevant. I don't understand this old school distinction, and that's something that the boys at the school understood. Everywhere my daughter went, they understood. They didn't know how crazy I was, but they knew I was crazy. They knew that if they put their hands on my daughter, I was already putting on one of the handcuffs. They were through. How could I live with explaining to my ancestors yes, that I did yes, nothing? Yes, yes. Now, I wonder how the situation would be with single females, abused, raped sisters, if fathers took that stance in our community now. I wonder how many brothers would be given second and third and fourth thoughts to putting their hands on her, except in love, if fathers took on the responsibility that they're supposed to. There was a sister who I talked to who was from Brooklyn, New York, and she said that uh, she came home from work early to find her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend in the basement engaging in sex. So they stopped because they saw her. She went back upstairs to the living room, sat down, they got dressed. He came upstairs first. And she asked him, if her father was here, would you have done that? He said no, and walked out the door. Boys ain't stupid. Boys know that men are crazy. 
boys know that when we say we will take you out of here, we mean we will take you out of here. And that's just like the boys at my school. They don't know how crazy I am. They just know that I'm crazy. And that's enough because that keeps them in line. What determines the longevity of the relationship? There are a number of things here. But first and foremost are the politics of the individuals. If you two don't have the same mission, then it ain't happening. It's just going to be strife. Every couple needs an umbrella mission, an umbrella philosophy, something that is greater than them. Something that no matter how many tremendous trifles occur, something that no matter what happens, they will still be together because this is more important. People used to ask uh, Yah and myself, why, how, what allowed you all to stay together so long? I said, because first and foremost, African people were our priority. It was our priority before we met. I just don't think that I was that clear on it. She was clear on it. So that, no matter what, happen is going to keep it together. No matter how many times I get ticked off, get in the car, drive for four or five hours so I can cool off, no matter how many times she gets ticked off, goes into a room, slams the door, turns on the television, sits there for four or five hours, we know that she's not going anywhere and neither am I. Because we are trying to do a revolution. And that can't stand in the way. So the politics aren't in agreement, then the relationship isn't going to last. That, that applies to whoever, Negroes, lost souls, Euros, whatever. If the politics aren't on the same plane, then the relationship is not going to last. Politics have to be on accord. They have to be on accord. They determine the longevity of the relationship. You have to have the understanding. There also has to be A joint vision that's a part of this where you all understand at least as warriors African warrior scholars you have to have a joint vision and I believe there are four parts of this joint vision uh, Malefe Asante also has four and they're a little bit different I argue that you have to have both both individuals have to know who their enemy is that has caused at least one divorce in the Atlanta African Center community this year because there was confusion about who the enemy was. And one individual thought that the enemy was their friend. And they had concealed that for a long time because they wanted to keep the person that they were with. Deceit is ugly in relationships. It's real ugly. Secondly, they must believe in the rearing of African children. And I'm not putting these in any kind of particular order, but they must believe in the rearing of African children. Not the raising of them, but the rearing of African children. Marie Evans made the distinction. She said, raising African children means that you provide for their basic needs, their food, their clothes, their shelter, you get them to school and back home. Take them to soccer practice. Get them to widescreen TV. Rearing African children means that you teach them who they are and about their power and what they need to be responsible to along with the food and the shelter and the clothing and the widescreen TV. There's a major difference. We've had people tell us in raising our daughter, she understood what the Ma'afa was about, the middle passage of slavery, by the time she hit the first grade. And she would tell me when I was giving her too much information. She understood that she could say, Dad, next year, on this one. And she would do that. She understood. That was okay because I understood that I was taking it too far or beyond her understanding. And that was cool. And we have people who would tell us, well, aren't you turning her against white folks? Aren't you making her life miserable? Won't she grow up to be, you know, a sourpuss? As you have your children watching X-Men cartoons, you have uh, Bert and Ernie cutting, slicing, and dicing people. You got them going to the movies watching blood and sex, and that's better than this? You teach your child about being African first. You give them our classics. You got to give them somebody else's classics for them to understand as if Du Bois couldn't write. 
is if Wright couldn't write, he got a whole collection of scholars. Give him some Octavia Butler. In Xavier Alexander, Sam Greenlee. You got a whole list of scholars that we have that they can read about who we are. It's sad that we think we got to go to somebody else to get classics. Number three, both individuals must humbly accept the role of being a worker. We have to be seen, we have to be applauded instantly, we have to have results instantly. Workers understand their mission. They don't need to be seen. If you're doing your work, you will be seen. But they have to understand the importance of being workers. Carter G. Woodson said we have too many leaders, not enough workers. I wonder why that's not quoted out of the miseducation of the Negro. <laughs> And finally, we have to have, well, both have to prize a vision of victory. You have to not just believe that we can win, which is what I used to say, and I was corrected by elders who told me, no, you say we are winning. Most of your motivational speakers will tell you, you don't talk about or affirm that you're going to become a doctor. You don't affirm that you're going to become a lawyer. You don't affirm that you become an architect. You don't affirm that you're going to become a revolutionary. You say, I am an architect. I am a doctor. I am a lawyer. I am a revolutionary. You tell yourself that, and then your mind, whose mission it is to do whatever you tell it to, will find the way to make you into that. It will find the resource. It'll put you into the right books. It'll get you to the right people to be that. When you tell it what it is. This thing works for you. We act somehow that like this, we work for this. This works for you. It's a paid employee. You feed it every day. Your mind is supposed to do your work, your bidding. It works for you. It was given to you to do your work. So you tell it what you want. And it will find a way to get it to you in the time that it can. You can't always operate, it can't always operate on your schedule. Sometimes you're not ready for it. I have a sign behind my computer that says, my ancestors gave me everything that I needed when I was ready. When I was ready. Not when I wanted it, because most of the time when I want it, I'm not ready for it. Just like a lot of brothers want polygamy, but they ain't ready. <laughs> Mentally, financially, physically, spiritually, they're not ready. There's nothing wrong with that because that's part of our traditions, but most of us aren't ready. We're ready for maybe serial monogamy, more game playing, less boredom, but we're not ready for the responsibilities that come with that. I'm having a hard enough time handling one woman. Or should I say she's having a hard enough time handling me? Malefe Asante gives us another list of four things that the revolutionary couple must embody, must act on, must practice. He says sacrifice, inspiration, vision, and victory. You must come into the situation willing to sacrifice whatever you need to sacrifice for our people. That sacrifice at that high level gives you that politics that's larger than you. So that little problems that you have seem insignificant. It's sort of like if you have uh, cut your foot on a piece of glass, and that's painful. And then somebody comes and blows your arm off. You start to focus on the missing arm, right? You forget all about the foot. Okay? So the cut on your foot is a tremendous trifle. The lost arm is the politics. Okay. The inspiration. The most important 
quality that my wife has for me and that I have for her is that we inspire each other, not only by watching each other do the work, but also when we get into funks, because you get sick and tired of Negroes, you get sick and tired of body counts, you get sick and tired of seeing brothers and sisters being hauled off to jail, and sisters are being hauled off to jail at a faster rate than black males now. When you get tired of it, sometimes you get into, I don't know if the young folks are used to or familiar with this term, we used back in the 70s and 60s, we say you get into a funk. You just don't feel like caring. Good thing for us, I usually get into a funk at a time that's different when she gets into a funk. So when she's in a funk, then I can say things and do things to bring her back into her African reality. And when I get into a funk, she can do and say things to me to bring me back into an African reality. We inspire each other. That's what we're supposed to do for each other. We're supposed to inspire each other. We have to have a vision, the third one. You have to have a vision. Um, Ayikwe Armour said that um, endless the day must seem to people who have no vision of the future, can't see past today. Yeah, that a vision that extends, in our tradition, seven generations. Everything that you do you have to judge it based upon its impact on African people seven generations down the road. You may never see the results. You're fighting for people. And if our ancestors are correct, we go in cycles, which means you're going to be there then just like you were there before. So you're doing, if you want to play the selfish game, okay, fine. You are selfishly trying to improve the future, so when you get there, everything will be fine. If we want to look at it that way. And finally, we have to have a victorious mentality, according to Baba Asante. We have to believe that we are already winning. We have to do whatever is necessary to do that.